Imagine swimming in the ocean, enjoying the waves, when suddenly a dark shadow glides below. What would you do if it was a shark closing in fast? Just the thought sends shivers down your spine, doesn't it? Well, if the idea of these mighty creatures lurking in the deep gives you the creeps, then brace yourself. These stories might just be too spine-tingling for you. Clara Bennett, a marine biologist, studied the behavior of great white sharks off the coast of California's Farallon Islands. The Farallon Islands, known for abundant marine life, have always been a hot spot where sharks congregate. However, there has been an alarming increase in aggressive behavior and encounters in recent months. While aboard a small research vessel, Dr. Bennett carefully recorded the increase in sharks and their aggressive interactions. The data was puzzling. Something was changing their behavior and pushing them to become more aggressive towards humans. On the islands, locals began to notice an alarming trend. Fishermen reported nets ripped apart and stories of sharks scaring them. Several locals went on late-night fishing trips and disappeared, leaving only questions. Fear grew among islanders. Dr. Bennett, driven by the need to understand these anomalies better and find solutions, teamed up with Jack Harper, an experienced fisherman with a vast knowledge of local waters. Together, they decided to track sharks' movements to discover any environmental changes that might influence their behavior. They found a previously unknown area of the ocean floor. They discovered an underwater crevasse using sonar mapping equipment. This may have been due to seismic activity in the area. The crevasse releases minerals and nutrients from deep seas into the water. This created an artificial upwelling that attracted several marine animals, including sharks. Sharks were exhibiting aggressive and territorial behavior due to the nutrient-rich water. Dr. Bennett, Jack, and the islanders realized this situation's danger to the local wildlife and the community. They devised a plan to seal off the crevasse to stop the flow of nutrients. They embarked on a risky operation with the help of local authorities and a group of environmental engineers. The goal was to place large concrete blocks and boulders at the opening of the crevasse. It was daunting, requiring precise timing and placement in waters filled with sharks. The team began operating from a modified barge equipped with heavy lifting gear and cranes. The initial attempts at positioning the boulders succeeded despite the sharks circling nearby. A mechanical failure in the barge crane delayed the placement of the final block. The delay was crucial. The team was in a dangerous situation as the sun set and cast a crimson tint over the water. Sharks began to close in, perhaps attracted by the activity or sensing disturbance to their feeding grounds. The barge was immobilized, and as night approached, Dr. Bennett, Jack, and their crew faced the terrifying reality of being trapped under the water and surrounded by sharks that were becoming increasingly aggressive. They hoped to fix the crane and seal the crevasse quickly before the situation worsened. As the shadows of the sharks became bolder, the sea whispered to them to keep going. The barge was rushing out of the darkness that enveloped the Farallon Islands. Clara Bennett, Jack Harper, and their crew scrambled to fix the mechanical failure. Great white sharks were active in the surrounding waters, and their silhouettes became more threatening with every passing minute. They worked furiously, knowing that each minute they lost would increase their risk. After what seemed like hours, the crane finally sputtered to life. They had no time to waste and resumed their operation to seal the crevasse. The final piece of concrete, designed to fit precisely over the opening in the crevasse, was carefully dropped towards the seabed. The team watched through underwater cameras as the boulder settled. The plume of nutrients slowly dissipated, and marine life activity slowed down. The intervention appeared to be working, but the situation must be monitored to confirm. As Dr. Bennett realized their plan had a chance of success, relief washed through them. Their celebration, however, was short-lived. Although less agitated than before, the sharks were still nearby and their patterns had been disrupted. The team had to retreat safely to evaluate the long-term impact of their actions. The ocean is unpredictable. As the crew prepared to depart, the vessel was gently rocked. Every crew member was on edge as they returned to the island. As they approached the harbor and its safety, the weight of their ordeal started to sink in. The fact that they had survived a deadly sea predator was a great accomplishment. In the following days, Dr. Bennett's team and their observatory on the island observed a gradual return of normal shark behavior. Sharks began to behave less aggressively, 
and the marine ecosystem started to recover. Fishermen reported fewer shark encounters, and the local community overcame their fear of water. The sealing of the crevasse is just the beginning. Dr. Bennett's findings highlighted the fragile balance of marine ecosystems and the unexpected effects of natural events such as seismic activity. Her work highlighted the importance of monitoring underwater geological changes in ocean conservation efforts. Jack Harper, a man who has lived all his life near the sea, developed a new appreciation for the efforts of the scientific community to protect and understand marine life. He used his experience to promote local conservation efforts. He educated others on the importance of preserving and respecting the natural world. The incident on the Farallon Islands was used as a case study in marine biology courses around the globe. The incident served as a stark reminder of the interconnectedness of life above and beneath the surface. The ability of the community to adapt to and respond to environmental issues was a testimony to human resilience. For Dr. Bennett, this experience strengthened her commitment to marine science. She continued to be fascinated by the Farallon Islands and their complex ecology and wild beauty. As the incident became known, Crimson Tide was an essential moment in her life that reaffirmed the importance of science to understanding and preserving our world. A thrilling underwater adventure began in 2001 off the calm yet wild coast of Ningaloo Reef in Western Australia. Four deep-sea diving experts, led by Dr. Emily Hansen of the Marine Biology Department, embarked on an expedition to explore a newly mapped shipwreck. Luca Moretti was an experienced wreck diver, Sarah Chen was a photographer specializing in underwater habitats, and Tom Bennett was a young marine engineer. The azure waters in the Indian Ocean hid secrets beneath the surface as the boat was anchored early one morning. The sun's rays penetrated the water and created a play of light, enticing the divers to dive deeper. They prepared their cameras and scuba equipment before diving into the ocean. Their hearts were filled with excitement as they hoped to discover the secrets of the sunken vessel. The playful light above gradually dimmed as they descended, and the water deepened to a darker blue. With each meter they sank, the sunlight became a mere memory. Finally, the silhouette of the wreck emerged, looming as a ghostly presence in the dim light. This large ship sank decades ago and has transformed into a vibrant artificial reef with diverse sea life. Divers were stunned by the sight. Coral formations had painted the ship in vivid colors. Schooling fish darted out of broken portholes while sea anemones held onto the deck with their tentacles gently waving in the current. The ocean could reuse and recycle what used to be on the surface. Emily was amazed at the ship's condition as they explored its perimeter. Each section of the boat tells a different tale about its life above water. Luca was busy pointing out the markings of the hull while Sarah was busy capturing each detail with her cameras. Tom, always curious, stepped away from the group to inspect a dense cluster of barnacles. Tom's dislodged part of the wreckage and their exploration suddenly took a new turn. A cloud of sand and silt swirled around them, reducing their visibility to almost zero. The particles settled, and an ominous silhouette emerged from the murky water. The divers froze in place, stunned. Before them loomed a shark, its body scarred from battles long past, its gaze piercing. These marks endowed it with an aura of primal power. The great predator radiated displeasure at the human intrusion into its domain. The divers had to act quickly, temporarily forgetting their escape route to the surface. Emily instructed the divers to remain calm and to maintain a compact group. The shark circled them with its sleek, deliberate movements. Every turn the shark made in the dim light sent shivers up their spines. Emily remembered her knowledge about shark behavior. She knew great whites were curious but cautious creatures. She gently aimed her flashlight away from them toward the open ocean. It was intended to divert the shark by giving it something to look at away from them. Luca, meanwhile, found a possible hiding place. An overhanging part of the wreckage could provide them with a temporary shield. He pointed to the others and they carefully moved towards the wreck, never taking their eyes off the great white. The shark seemed to grow more interested in the light as they nestled under the wreck. It slowly moved away from them into the sea's most profound darkness. As they watched the predator disappear, their hearts beat faster. The shark was still there, and they knew it. 
It was now up to them to find a way to get back to the boat without attracting the shark's attention. It would take all of their knowledge and wit to solve the problem. The ocean is not forgiving. They needed to act quickly. The team returned to the surface cautiously. The team navigated the labyrinth created by the corroded metal, overgrown sea life, and old ship. Each move was carefully calculated with a keen awareness of their surroundings. Sarah turned off her camera to avoid attracting unwanted attention. Tom ensured they had enough air to get them safely to the boat. Luca held his dive knife and watched for any sign of the shark's return. Emily was thinking about the behavior of the shark as she moved. The intelligence and curiosity of great white sharks are well known. The disturbance that they caused at first had likely drawn it. She hoped their more controlled and deliberate movements would make them seem less intrusive in this underwater realm. They reached a dense area of reef about halfway to their boat. This provided plenty of cover. Emily suggested that they ascend a few meters to reduce their risk of nitrogen narcosis. The group agreed to this, realizing the importance of both safety and strategy. As they climbed, their bodies adjusted slowly. The water became lighter as they rose, signaling that the sunlit waters were less dangerous. Even in the relative safety of the sunlit waters, they were still vigilant because they knew that a shark might be lurking nearby. They finally spotted the boat in the distance. It was a minor but comforting silhouette against the vast sea. They increased their speed slightly, eagerly rushing to safety. Tom saw a shadow in the peripheral of his vision. His heart skipped a few beats as he called out to the others. They watched as a prominent figure approached. The shark was there, its vast form quickly cutting through the water. Emily realized it was following their previous activities. She knew that they had to divert the shark one more time. She prepared to release the non-toxic dye cloud from a canister she brought for emergencies. A strong push through the water spread the dye, creating a dark, cloudy effect. The new stimuli enticed the shark and veered away from its original path. The divers seized the opportunity and made a final push to the boat. The divers reached the ship just as the dye faded and climbed aboard in relief. The adrenaline began to fade, and the reality of the experience slowly sank into their minds. The team survived by respecting the marine environment and using quick thinking. Emily kept a log of the events that day, recording every detail. This encounter taught Emily a valuable lesson about the fragile balance of marine ecosystems and nature's unpredictable behavior. The calm ocean magnified the profound depths they had ventured into. Amid this tranquility, the shark emerged as a stark reminder of the ocean's untamed nature. The divers looked on with admiration and fear, thankful for their safety, yet aware that each dive carried its uncertainty. They knew their subsequent descent into these mysterious waters could be just as unpredictable. In 2003, a lavish beach party unfolded on the white sands of a private island in the Maldives. This remote paradise, encircled by the crystal clear waters of the Indian Ocean, offered an idyllic escape. A group of guests had chosen this secluded haven to enjoy the sun and sand, seeking a tranquil retreat far from the bustle of everyday life. Their presence on the island underscored its allure as a perfect hideaway. The party began in the late afternoon as the island glowed under the bright sun reflecting off the turquoise water. The guests lounged on a white sandy beach while sipping exotic beverages and enjoying the luxurious atmosphere. The setting was beautiful, with palms swaying in the wind and gourmet food spread out under a canopy decorated by vibrant tropical flowers. As the sun dipped toward the horizon, several guests chose to cool off in the inviting ocean. Their laughter and splashes filled the air, masking the ominous shadow that moved stealthily beneath the surface. The initial hint of danger was subtle, a brief splash, a startled cry. Only moments before, the water had been serene and transparent. Panic quickly erupted and the guests scrambled frantically out of the water, their faces etched with terror. A monster shark, far more prominent than the typical predators of these waters, had made itself known. The dark silhouette of the shark was visible below the surface as it circled the area where the guests were swimming. The massive shark glided frighteningly through the water, its movements deliberate. The guests began to realize they were stuck on an island, cut off by the mainland. Fear had shattered the festive mood of the guests, and they gathered on a beach. The guests watched helplessly as the shark patrolled the waters with its dorsal fin, slicing its surface like a warning sign. 
It would sometimes disappear into the depths, but reappear nearer the shore as if to taunt its stranded victims. The island became eerie as the night fell. Lanterns from the party uncertainly danced on the sand. Usually calm, the ocean now appeared as a vast, insurmountable barrier. The guests tried to form a plan as they huddled. The guests had to survive until rescue, but their options were limited because the shark controlled the water. As they surveyed their supplies, food and medical supplies, and any tools that might be used as weapons or deterrents, tension was palpable. Some guests started constructing crude spears out of broken branches and debris. In contrast, others searched the island for any items that might help signal for assistance. The shark was a constant danger, and its appearance on the shore reminded the guests of their vulnerability. The reality of the situation became more apparent as the first night went on. The likelihood of another attack increased with each passing hour. They knew they would need a better plan to survive until help arrived. The group needed to learn the shark's habits and how to keep it away. They needed to keep out of the water and have the cunning and the unity necessary to survive. They watched the water, knowing the next day would bring new challenges. Their fight for survival had just begun. The situation became more apparent as dawn broke on the island. The shark kept up its relentless patrol. Its presence was a constant danger to the stranded tourists. The guests were stranded with no hope of rescue, and their supplies ran out. They needed a viable plan. Guests observed the behavior of the shark throughout the morning. They noted its patterns and when it came closer to the shore. It was attracted by splashes and movement in the water. With this information, they devised an elaborate plan to create a distraction that would allow them to signal for help while avoiding the shark's attention. They built a raft from leftover party decorations, guided by the technical know-how of an engineer among the guests. Their strategy was to affix an emergency flare to the raft as a distress signal. They planned to launch it from the island's far side, an area frequently visited by sharks, hoping the ocean currents would carry it far enough to be visible to passing planes or ships. This way, they could signal for help without agitating the waters near their own location. The raft was completed by midday. A small group of people waded into the water with calm excitement and careful movements to launch the raft. They watched as the raft floated away. The flare was ready to ignite when the raft reached a safe distance. The next few minutes were a test of patience and nerves. The guests kept a close eye on the shark and raft. They were ready to take action at the first sign that either failed. The flare was lit when the raft had reached what the guests hoped would be a safe distance. The bright red flare was a striking contrast to the blue sky of midday. All eyes were on the flare in hopes that it would attract the attention of rescuers. The shark, possibly curious at the sudden flash of light, moved towards deeper water and temporarily avoided the island. The guests took advantage of this opportunity to prepare their temporary shelter if help was still hours or days away. The flare was out of light as the evening turned into night. There was no immediate sign that help would be coming. The plan was not in vain. The flare was spotted by a passing cargo ship which contacted the local authorities. The guests were unaware that rescue was on the way. The night was filled with anxiety and long waiting. The two men took turns watching the shark as it circled the island. Its predatory nature was not deterred. As the sun rose the following day, a helicopter sounded to break the silence. As they waved furiously, the rescue team was attracted to them. The team worked quickly to evacuate all of the people from the island. Everyone saw the shark still patrolling in the water below as they boarded their helicopter. The ordeal was over, but those days of terror would live on in the minds of all who witnessed it. The guests told their story of survival when they returned to the mainland. They were bonded in unexpected ways by the experience, which reminded them of the strength of the human spirit. The experience left them with a greater respect for the ocean depths and the creatures that live there, as a reminder of the power of nature, even in paradise. The community of Gansbai in South Africa, a coastal town known for its rugged coastline and abundant marine life, was preparing for the 2004 tourist season. The 2004 tourist season was crucial to the city, which had been struggling with economic difficulties. Inviting tourists interested in shark cage diving and watching whales would boost the community's local economy. 
a renowned local shark hunter, famous for his bold exploits, ventured beyond his usual territory in search of a catch that would secure his place in maritime hunting lore. His target was a pregnant great white shark known to frequent the waters near Gansbai. Although his hunt was successful, it triggered a series of unfortunate events. The shark he killed was paired with another great white, recognized by distinctive black markings on its dorsal fin and locally known as black fin. Blackfin was so distraught by its loss that it altered its behavior. It had previously avoided the shallow waters around the beach. Now it is a regular visitor and moves almost deliberately aggressively. A local fisherman first noticed that his nets had been destroyed. This was far more than the usual damage caused by marine life. Blackfin became more and more dangerous as the weeks went by. The town was filled with a chilling air as swimmers reported close encounters. As the season approached, the beaches were eerily quiet. As the news of these encounters spread, tourists canceled their bookings out of fear for their safety. Businesses faced closure and the future of the town was in jeopardy. Initially skeptical, the local authorities needed to recognize the issue once marine biologists confirmed Blackfin's unusual behavior. The shark had not been passing through but was now identifying where it had experienced conflict. The town council called an emergency meeting to discuss possible actions. They contacted experts in shark tracking and marine behavior to develop a plan to deter blackfin safely. Residents of the town were on high alert. A palpable sense of tension is marked every day. A collective breath was held until nightfall. The harbor, once crowded with tourists and boats, was mostly empty. The water around the harbor was unaffected except for blackfin's ominous circle. A group of conservationists in the area saw the opportunity to save the tourist season and change the town's fortunes by changing their approach to wildlife-based tourism. They suggested a shift in focus from shark hunting to conservation. They argued that protecting blackfin would attract a new visitor more interested in conservation and educational activities than thrill-seekers. The town's first step in deciding on this new strategy was obvious. It needed to guarantee immediate safety while also developing a plan for the future that would benefit both the town and the marine residents. The challenge was daunting, but the stakes were too high to ignore. The solution needed to not only deal with the immediate threat of blackfin, but also pave a path for a sustainable and respectful relationship between the community and the natural world. The decisions they were about to make would determine the survival of Gansbai, both economically and in terms of community. The town of Gansbai acted quickly because of the urgency of the situation. They had to deal with sharks in their waters to move towards a more sustainable approach. This was done without harming the sharks or disrupting the marine environment. Marine biologists and shark experts were brought in to help with this crisis. They began by installing acoustic devices near the most popular areas. These devices are designed to emit sounds that sharks find unpleasant but are harmless. This encourages Blackfin to leave the beach areas. The town also launched a campaign aimed both at locals and visitors. The campaign emphasized the importance of conservation of the marine environment and the role that sharks play in the ecosystem. The campaign explained new safety measures for people and sharks. The campaign began by changing the narrative of fear into one of respect and coexistence for wildlife. Blackfin sightings in near shore waters decreased as these efforts gained traction. The shark appeared to be returning to its natural habitat, deeper waters. The community cautiously welcomed this shift, but knew the real test would be the peak of tourist season. Gansbai had everything ready for the arrival of the season. Drones were used to monitor the beaches for safety, and the acoustic repellents continued to work. Now, tour operators offer educational tours that focus on shark conservation. These include visits to research facilities and lectures from marine biologists. The tourists returned, much to everyone's relief. They were attracted by the promise of learning and seeing marine life responsibly. The town has been transformed. Businesses preparing for closure are flourishing, and many have shifted to support the ecotourism model. Local economies began to recover due to the influx of visitors who wanted to support a community that valued sustainability over sensationalism. The conservationists and scientists kept an eye on blackfin as the season progressed. The biologists and conservationists tracked blackfin's behavior and migration patterns, collecting data to contribute to shark conservation efforts. 
The research helped Gansby manage its marine life and position the town as an ethical leader in wildlife tourism. In the following months, the story about Gansby's blackfin was told to a larger audience. Documentaries and articles showed how the town transformed a crisis into a catalyst for change by highlighting the importance of protecting and respecting the natural world. Gansby became a model of how to balance human activity and wildlife conservation. The town organized a marine conservation festival in the final days of tourist season. The festival celebrated the success and efforts of the community to live in harmony. Blackfin was once a sign of loss and revenge, but now it symbolizes resilience and adaptability. The festival ended with the residents of Gansby looking out at the waters that had threatened their existence but now offered a sustainable future. The balance they achieved was fragile and would require constant effort and vigilance. For now, however, they saved their town, enriched their relationship with the ocean, and ensured that both could flourish. Blackfin's legacy would not be a tale about revenge, but rather a story about redemption and hope for a better future. Miami, Florida was hit by an unprecedented natural disaster in August 2000. Hurricane Eloise was a storm of unprecedented force that barreled relentlessly toward Miami. Residents stocked up on supplies and boarded their windows to prepare for impact. But nothing prepared them for the unique danger that came with the storm. As Eloise landed, powerful winds and torrential rainfall battered the coastal city. The streets quickly flooded and turned into rivers while neighborhoods were transformed into lakes. Storm surges pushed beyond the usual boundaries of the beach, bringing debris and seawater and several bull sharks displaced from their habitats. Bull sharks are usually found in shallow coastal waters near Miami. However, these bull sharks were swimming through streets that had been flooded and past submerged cars. Floodwaters turned the urban environment murky and expansive for these powerful predators. Sharks quickly adapted to their new surroundings, with their instincts taking over to hunt in the flooded urban waters. Residents of Miami were already struggling with the devastation caused by the hurricane. Now they faced an even more terrifying reality. They had to remain vigilant as they tried to escape to higher ground or sought refuge in the upper floors of the building. Each splash or shadow on the water's surface could be a threat. Hurricane Eloise continued to rage, and the floodwaters were high. The city was awash with bull sharks now living in the streets. This added an unreal and terrifying dimension to the disaster. Once known for its bustling life, the town became filled with quiet chaos. Nature had taken over the urban landscape. Things became dire in neighborhoods such as Little Havana and Coconut Grove, where floodwaters were the deepest. The situation was hazardous for elderly residents and families with small children who could not navigate the water safely. The people used anything they could find, including inflatable mattresses and floating debris, to move through the waters while keeping a close eye on the bottom. The city fell into an eerie silence as the night wore on, punctuated by the howling winds and the splashes of water caused by the movement made by the sharks. Most of the city was in darkness due to the lack of power. Only the flashes of lightning illuminated the streets. The emergency services were stretched beyond their capacity. Rescue teams on boats navigated submerged streets to try and reach people trapped in their homes or stranded on rooftops. Sharks were present in the water making their task even more dangerous. The floodwaters hid the usual obstacles of urban life and the additional dangers of displaced predators. Residents of Miami faced a night filled with uncertainty as the first day of the storm ended. The intensity of Hurricane Eloise began to diminish as dawn broke on Miami. The floodwaters continued to linger, and the bull sharks kept on their unplanned journey through the streets of Miami. It was only when the sun came out that the extent of the destruction and the strange reality of marine predators patrolling the streets of what were once busy city thoroughfares became apparent. Tired from a night's vigilance, residents began better coordinating their actions. As the storm weakened, community leaders and volunteers set up makeshift command centers at elevated points within the city. They started directing people to safer areas using megaphones and any battery-powered devices they could find. They guided them along less flooded routes that sharks had scouted. Scientists from the local Marine Biological Institute studied this unique interaction between urban environments, aquatic life, and the environment. 
The scientists advised the rescue crews on predicting shark movements, influenced by currents created by slowly receding floodwaters. Understanding these patterns helped rescue teams avoid areas where sharks are most likely located. The temporary hunting grounds of the sharks began to shrink as the water receded. This funneled them into the deeper waters along Miami's main arteries. The consolidation of sharks in more predictable areas made it easier to evacuate and conduct rescue operations. Drones were used to monitor shark movements from above and provide real-time updates for the teams on the field. As they worked together, the community was put to the test. High water vehicles were brought in to provide essentials and transport people to temporary housing. Local radio and social media informed people about evacuation routes and shark sightings. After several days, the floodwaters began to recede sufficiently to allow for a large-scale evacuation. National Guard units arrived with more resources and a better understanding of the situation. The city faced a monumental task once the water receded enough to reveal the streets. The town was left with scars from the temporary presence of sharks. Buildings had been damaged, cars scattered, and marks were visible on the urban landscape. The relief of knowing that the immediate threat was over was palpable. The city then took steps to prepare itself for future anomalies. The town designed barriers that could be deployed quickly to stop marine life from entering areas populated during floods. The community was better prepared and informed by implementing educational programs on the dangers posed by wildlife in natural disasters. This experience brought to light the delicate balance between urban living and nature. The ordeal also highlighted the unpredictable nature of climate change and how it can bring marine life into direct contact with cities. Miami residents survived the hurricane and adapted to a unique challenge, navigating through a shark-infested flood. The experience was unforgettable, reminding everyone of nature's unpredictability and power. On a cold evening in September 2004, the college swimming team gathered at the shores of Lake Baikal in Russia. This is the deepest lake on Earth and also one of the most mysterious. It was a night of initiation, a rite of passage for the new swim team members. The tradition of swimming across a dark, isolated lake area was to be continued. The lake's glassy surface reflected the dim light from the moon and the surrounding quietness added to the eerie ambiance. The team of experienced swimmers and recruits prepared themselves on the lakeshore. The team donned their goggles and swim caps with their skin tingling in anticipation and from the cold. Senior members told tales from past swims. Each added a layer to the event's lore but omitted the latest danger lurking below the calm surface. Unknown to them, a group of bull sharks had been introduced into the lake, a species not native to this freshwater lake. The exotic pet dealers who illegally introduced these sharks into the lake had underestimated their adaptability and resilience. Sharks not only survived but thrived in the freshwater environment. The water was shockingly cold on their warm skin as the team started their swim. The team began swimming in a close group. Their safety headlamps cut through the darkness of the water and created an otherworldly glow. The calmness was misleading because predators had already become aware of the disturbance beneath the lake. The team members encouraged each other to swim with steady strokes and completed the first half without incident. As they approached the deeper part, their mood changed. A little behind the group, a recruit felt a sharp, sudden tug on her leg. She tried to scream in a panic, but the water muffled her cries. She struggled in the water, but the group behind did not notice her struggles. The team had spread so far out that confusion set in by the time the swimmer disappeared. The vast, dark water suddenly seemed threatening and full of unknown dangers. A swimmer who felt a brush on his foot instinctively kicked out, his heart racing as he realized something was wrong. The group was shocked to learn they weren't alone in the water. What had begun as a structured swimming session turned into a desperate struggle to survive. The team's cohesion began to break down as each swimmer responded differently. Some tried to swim faster while others froze. They could not see past the headlamp beams in the darkness. Each splash and wave signaled a new danger. The seriousness of the situation became apparent as more team members began to disappear being pulled underwater without a trace. The initiation became a life-threatening struggle for survival, as the depths of Lake Baikal claimed them individually. 
The remaining swimmers tried desperately to regroup in the chaos that followed. Their minds were racing as they attempted to understand the danger they faced. Some swimmers located each other in darkness, with their headlamps bobbing like fragile beacons. They all decided to run straight for the nearest land, knowing they could only survive by escaping from the water. The lake's cold water soaked into their bones and slowed their movement. The swimmers swam in a mixture of urgency and fear, aware that an attack could come at any time. The lake had changed from a tranquil and beautiful place to a terrifying landscape. Each ripple of the water was a warning that danger lurked below. The dark waters behind them remained silent, with the only sounds coming from their frantic strokes and heavy breathing echoing through the night. They tried not to think about their teammates who were gone. Instead, they focused on the faint outline of the shoreline lined with trees. The swimmers' muscles were burning from the exertion, and their minds were filled with fear. But they kept going because of the will to live. After what seemed an eternity, one of the swimmers finally felt the bottom of the lake rise under them. After reaching the shallow water near the shore, they collapsed from exhaustion. Even as they lay there, gasping to breathe, their relief from the ordeal that they had just endured was tempered by horror and the knowledge that not everyone had survived. After the terrifying swim, survivors gathered around, shaking from shock and cold. The survivors were safe at the moment, but their trauma and the loss of friends were overwhelming. The magnitude of what had happened began to dawn as the sun rose, casting a pale light on the lake. At first light, the authorities were alerted, and a search and rescue operation was initiated. The search for the missing team members was conducted in the lake, but the task became difficult and dangerous due to the presence of sharks. The tragedy spread quickly, and the community surrounding Lake Baikal was shocked. In the weeks following, steps were taken to remove and capture the sharks. The incident ignited a conversation about wildlife conservation and the illegal pet industry, highlighting the dangers of introducing non-native species into unfamiliar ecosystems. The swimmers survived with physical scars, a deep respect for nature, and a painful reminder of how easily adventure can turn into disaster. They still carried the memory of that night on Lake Baikal, a reminder of how thin the line is between youthful adventure and mortal danger. The lake, now serene, still held in its depths the secrets of the night, a testament to the unpredictable nature of the world and unintended consequences caused by human interference.